It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Hashim Barakat, DDS, MAGD, diplomat, the American Board of Oral Implantology, diplomat, I mean, my gosh, he's got the entire alphabet suit, but just start singing A, B, C, D, E, F, G. He received his DDS in 1998 from Alexandria University School of Dentistry, Egypt, and completed postgraduate training, AEGD, GPR, from Louisiana State University, I assume, in Nolens, in 2001 and 2003. He's the diplomat of the American Board of Oral Implantology, and recognized as one of the top implant dentists in the United States. Uh, Dr. Barakat is one of just 445 dentists certified by the ABOI in the United States and one of 10 practitioners in Virginia to hold this certification. Dr. Barakat has been awarded mastership status in the AGD, diplomat in the ICOI, which is the highest credential offered by international recognized organization for dentists who have shown experience in dental implantology. He also enjoys lecturing both nationally and internationally nationally about implant dentistry to help increase the education of his fellow dentists. He currently serves as a part-time faculty member at the Medical College of Virginia School of Dentistry. He also served as continuing education chair for the AGD Virginia chapter. And then next to him is Mark Saraprano, Chief OO, Chief Operating Officer, and CMO, Chief Marketing Officer. So he's a um, Chief Marketing and Operations at Guardian Dentistry Partners. Um, he used to be with Aspen, where he supported the $1.1 billion Aspen Dental brand, which grew to 600 retail practices in 34 states during his tenure. Mr. Senzo Prano was responsible for all marketing, media, CRM, which is customer relations management, corporate communications, public affairs, employment brand, and recruiting efforts. His advertising, digital marketing, PR, and social media campaigns led to record levels of patient demand, 10 national marketing awards, 100% growth in sales and earning, and two private equity transactions within five years. He has been in various C-level and senior leadership positions throughout his career at companies such as Art Van Furniture, Signet Jewelers, Darden Restaurants, The Campbell Soup Company, and SC Johnson & Son. Gentlemen, it's an honor to have both of you on this show. And I just want to say that... um. You know, you just always got to steal from the, the, the best. I mean, if you're running one office and Aspen's out there running 600, if you don't know that they might know something you don't, you need to see a psychiatrist because, dude, they do. You can barely run one dental office. And when I ask you any basic grammar school questions about your office, like how many incoming calls did you have last month? I don't know. How many did you have last year? I don't know. Um, how many of your calls go to uh, on hold? I don't know. These guys know, and they have an amazing track record, and I bring them on the show um, not to um, help them. I can't help them, but to help you. I mean, they're going to share what the – I want you to learn from the big boys that you can take home to your solo practicing office. So, um, gentlemen, thanks so much for coming on the show. How are you guys doing? Great, great. How are you? Good, Fantastic, good, good. Fantastic, Howard. Thank you. Oh, so, um, my gosh. Um, well, first of all, just in case one of my homies doesn't know about um, Guardian Dentistry Partners, um, would one of you for, first explain what that is uh, to someone who's uh, never heard of it before? Well, Guardian Show me Dentistry. want to take that? Go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead. So Guardian Dentistry uh, Partners, uh, Dental Partners, is, is, a, is um, I would say, um, a newer uh, partnership organization that basically started in 2018. Um, we are a group of uh, dental partners in different regions. We're in uh, seven states. And uh, we started with one region, and then we followed one region after the other. And we're like-minded, you know, dental entrepreneurs that came together, uh, that brought in all their knowledge and uh, their expertise, running their own offices, their own groups. And we came together to um, excel, to grow, to preserve our past and, uh, you know, build our future together. So it's, it's been a phenomenal, uh, you know, time so far um, since we started and it, the growth is, has been tremendous. And, and I, I want to teach a I want to teach a trick to the the young kids because I, I know in dental school 
um, they're all on, you know, like Instagram and Snapchat, and um, they're all Facebook because their grandma's on it. But um, a great thing to learn when you hear about a company, um, just go to LinkedIn. LinkedIn's where all the money in dentistry is. Instagram's where all the children in dentistry are. <laughs> um, so if I go to Guardian Dentistry Partners, they have an about, and it says founded um, Guardian Dental Partners, founded by a group of passionate dentists, and a family office. Guardian Dentistry Partners is an emerging dental partnership network dedicated to providing world-class support services and growth opportunities for its network of dentist partners. Established in 2018, my God, it's only two years old. Guardian has expanded rapidly and now supports dental entrepreneurs in Michigan, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Virginia. Um, Guardian's mission is to help its dental partners and teams build the practices of their dreams. so basically, um, the 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 big million dollar question is, God dang, you started at 2018, and then you met this. Uh, the first dentist you met was uh, Doctor Coronavirus. Uh, did that just? Um, I mean, I, I mean, I, I remember reading about the plague, learning about the Spanish influenza. Never once did it dawn on me I'd be living through a damn pandemic. But if you know what you knew now. Would you have not open, started this in 2018? Would you say, hey, let's uh, let's just go hang out at the beach and drink Mai Tais for a couple of years? I mean, how, how would, you, would you have started in 2018 if you knew this was around the corner? This is a fantastic question, Howard. I think, if you don't mind me calling you uh, Howard uh, or, doc, or Dr. Fran. Please. So you this can is even a call me question. Howie like my mom. How, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing that came to my mind in uh, March of 2019 – or in April and May of 2000, sorry, in March, April, May 2020, was what would I have done if I didn't have that amazing um, partnership with, with, these, with these amazing people? I would be on my own. I would be struggling on my own, trying to figure out all these unanswered questions by myself. So has it been a crazy um, uh, year? Absolutely. But what made it less crazy and more of, uh, of an accomplishment that, that we had each other. And I thought about this every night during the pandemic. Um, had I done it on my own and uh, stayed on my own with my group and not joined Guardian and the other partners, it would have been a hundred times tougher. So what we had during that time was an amazing test for our strength, our, our, our you know, relationship, our partnership, we were tested on every front, and I think that made a huge difference that once we got through May and we started reopening and get, got back on track, hey, if you can survive this, we can survive anything else. The test came too early, though, <laughs> which was good in a way. Uh, it, it gave us you know, a reality check on how strong we are. Um, I think that um, the pandemic was a huge value to the brand and DSOs because, I mean, um, um, I mean, people have been flocking, hoping that they were going to um, buy out their office. Um, um, do you, uh, for those reasons, it was it was too much on their plate for one dentist to deal with this, and being part of a big team um, was was really kind of nice during a, a big pandemic and big problems. Uh, do you think this has um, been a big lift to uh, the brand? I mean, even Dental Town. I mean, my gosh, uh, Dental Town uh, exploded during the pandemic because. What a lot of people might have been going there for maybe fun or this or that. When the shit hit the fan, they're like, they, they, boom, our, we, we, our traffic doubled overnight. Um, do you think, um, do you think it's been good for the DSO brand uh, amongst dentists? I'm not talking about patients, but uh, uh, the DSO brand among dentists? Oh, 100%. 100%. You know, that when you, when you come across a crisis, the first thing you, you ask yourself, am I alone in this? What, what are the other people doing? What's going on? And, and you know, I've been a member of Dental Town, by the way, for, for the past uh, 16 years, since 2004. And since you guys started, and I've had the magazines, I've had, I followed everything, but also the ADA. Um, we, we, you know, when you're in a crisis, you try to reach out and see what other people are doing. What are you guys, how is everybody handling it? Having each other at Guardian made our brand stronger. And uh, during the pandemic, actually, we were just launching, you know, our brand and uh, getting started with this. So, yes, the slow time or the slowdown in our operations gave us a chance to regroup and focus on our projects that we just put together. And it was a good time to execute and train our team members. So it came with a huge benefit. 
And, uh, you know, Mark was on our case <laughs> saying, hey, guys, let's use that time. Let's go ahead and, uh, and get regroup. Let's uh, focus on what we want to do. Let's go ahead and get our projects done. This is a great time. Let's retrain our team members. So that was a huge deal um, during that time. And, and we maximized the time and the downtime we had for ourselves and our team members. I, I hate to go negative and bring up something negative and all this stuff, but, you know, I'm, I, I'm, um, you're, it's an honest conversation. One of the biggest threads on Dentaltown is cancel your ADA membership because um, uh, uh, the, the guy starts off saying dental offices should have never closed down, and I totally blame the ADA. They majorly dropped the ball. I will never be a member again. Um, I've always been a member of the ADA. I, 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 I kind of look at them like they're my parents. Um, you know, my parents aren't perfect. Uh, I'm sure even my four boys would say that I wasn't <laughs> uh, perfect. But, I mean, do you think um, – well, how would you answer that threat on Dentaltown? I mean, we, um, they're, they're mad. And, and I predicted on this show that when, when the shit hits the fan, um, like, like your kids – when, when the sh- shit hits the fan, you know, as a parent, you're going to take some flat. I mean, if um, I knew when these dentists were in the middle of the pandemic, I said, well, the first person that they're going to take it out on is their mom and dad, the ADA, <laughs> the AGD. You know, they're, 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 they're going to blame anybody who's in the room and uh, the ADA is in the room. So how, how would you respond to that? Uh, cancel your ADA membership because they, um, they closed down d- the dental offices. You know, I would strongly oppose that opinion because this is where uh, we went every single, every single morning. We get the email, whether, by the way, you were an ADA member or not. They were uh, courteous and uh, generous to share the information they had, the updates, the morning huddle that they had every morning. Well, I mean, we went by that. It, it summarized what's going on with the pandemic and in dentistry. It gave us the updates on the CDC. It gave us the updates on everything. Um, that was priceless. And the communication we received every morning and the updates and the stats and was something that you can't, you can't put a, a, a price tag on. So I, I'm not sure how, what, what people who said can't see ADA membership were thinking. I'm a member of the ADA, the AGD, the AAID, and um, they're great organizations. They have great communications and it's a great, um, you know, just camaraderie to have and to, to feel like you're not alone. So we got a lot of our guidance from the CDC and the ADA, and that was what we uh, communicated to our team members and our partners. And what was hard for me to watch is, um, cause, um, and it's not just because I'm Irish, but the executive director is Kathleen O'Laughlin, DMD, MPH. But I mean, as she was, you know, she's been the executive director for 10 years, and she was battling this, not, not only is she the first five-star general captain that I would have thrown behind the deal, but she lost her daughter during this from this, you know, and I mean, and, you know, these guys taking pop shots that are like, they didn't think this out. It's like, dude, when you lose your daughter from COVID-19 and you're a dentist, I'm pretty sure you thought it out. You know what I mean? I mean, this woman, I mean, I even told her, I said, if I would have lost, if I lose one of my four boys right now, I mean, I, I couldn't go back to work. Hell, I would just go. I mean, I, I, I would lose it. And she's just like a crazy above the board machine that just keeps on dealing. So, so how many offices do you have now? How, how many are you managing in those five states? By year end, uh, Howard, we're going to have uh, 50 offices. So you said, you know, we just started uh, a hot minute ago, 2018, and you asked about uh, COVID. We're we're blown away and humbled by the interest that we're receiving in little old guardian dentistry partners right now in terms of the, I think you hit the nail on the head, the dentists who are saying, man, if it wasn't tough before, um, live through trying to run your small practice uh, or your small group through COVID um, and all the complexity that came with that. Um, we're, we're amazed by uh, the number of folks who are, who are approaching us who, who want support and want help. It's crazy. So you were um, with Aspen for a long time. This isn't your first rodeo. Um, first, I want to um, talk about the 4,000-pound elephant in the room, other than myself. Is, um, um, why do you think dentists um, – what, what, what do you think the average thought of, of – uh, 
What do you think dentists think of DSO? Like, if you got all the dentists in a, in a coliseum of 150,000 people and said, what do you think about DSOs? What do you think they um, think about Aspen? And, um, and what, what do you think it actually is? And where do you think that thought comes from? Yeah, it's interesting. If you asked me that question when I joined uh, eight, eight or nine years ago, um, I would have said, I think generally there's a negative feeling towards, you know, DSOs, dental services organizations, dental support organizations, whatever, whatever you want to refer to them as. I think that's changed an enormous amount, even the ADA. Back then, uh, there was a battle that was ensuing. The ADA didn't even want to recognize this business model of um, companies coming in to provide support services to the industry. I think that's changed quite a bit because I think things are getting more and more complicated. It's harder and harder for uh, a general dentist to run their practice and un understand um, insurance and dealing with carriers and malpractice and IT and, and how marketing has evolved. Um, I think that there's, uh, uh, what is it, 50% of graduating dental school students also now are joining DSOs coming right off of campuses. I think that's that's kind of a sea, a sea change in the industry. Whether or not DSOs are, I don't know, you, you probably know what percentage they're up to in the industry. Is it 20% yet? Well, you know, with, with all stats, it depends on how you measure location by dentist. I'm Stan Bergman, the CEO of Shine, uh, says that DSOs buy 18% of dental supplies. Um, if you go by the number of dentists, uh, some say it's 12%. But the word DSO, what I, I don't like about it is um, it's, um, it used to be group practice and, um, you know, group practice with more than one location. And, um, and then when it gets to a certain number of size, it's called a DSO, but it's really group practice. If, if you don't figure out, and then I want to remind people that, you know, Ray Kroc, um, when he stumbled across the McDonald's uh, franchise of business, they already had 10 locations and it was still a mess. And it took a lot of times to get their prototype down. And when they got their prototype down, uh, they started to scale. And I've seen a lot of people um, go under because they had one location, they borrowed a bunch of money, they bought two other locations. They didn't have their prototype down. In fact, what's really bizarre is the sweet spot of bankruptcy in dentistry now is between like three and four million dollars you think oh my god they um and, and greg stanley i have to give credit called that first greg stanley called it first and he says my god loaning a dentist 10 million dollars sort of dso is guaranteed bankruptcy those growing pains on the first year you have to organically grow from one to ten because that's when you're going to figure out what the hell you're doing if someone just loans you ten million dollars you're going to go buy ten offices you're not going to have any systems you're just guaranteed death um my gosh um th there's i i think there's many um market segments i mean take a car i could go buy a lamborghini i could buy a benz i could buy a taurus a ford escort i could buy a used car i could buy a moped and um look at housing i could buy a mansion a three-bedroom a uh, studio apartment are like me. I actually live in a van down by the river. Um, so market segment. So when you hear people talk about that all dentistry should be like this, I mean, that's actually communism. That's a centrally planned. Here's one product you can, no, they, I mean, they really do. They, this is the way it is. And, and, and that's how the government ruins everything. Like look at education. So the federal government tells all the schools how to run and do all these testing. And we've drifted from, like almost number one all the way down to 38. Because if you took that, the Department of Education to fast food, there would just be one fast food joint and you would never have gotten, you know, In-N-Out Burger and Wendy's and Burger King. You just would have eaten the government burger. And 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 I still think that the, um, the final business model for DSOs, I don't even think it's been discovered yet because it's not a successful model right. if you can't keep your dentist. And We agree um, with you. And the number one complaint, I, I'm in ground zero for DSOs because Arizona's governor passed a law that said, if you're licensed for a skill in any other state, you're good in Arizona. So 18%, 18.7% of all the dentists in Arizona work for a DSO out of about 6,500. And when you look at that long tail, the last five states, they don't even have 1%. So they're all moving here. And I already know um, what they're after. They're after is um, why do... Um, dentists come out of school 
and they um, they change jobs every year. And and we see it with millennials across the board. We see it in the FANG stocks. Facebook, Apple, Network, Google, Microsoft, they throw everything at these employees and these young kids. Amazon has the lowest, they only stay there for a year. Facebook has the longest, they only stand there two years. But so when people say, well, they burn in, they don't keep employees at the DSOs, well, you don't keep them in your private office either. So how do you build a brand so that every time they come to Guardian Dental Partners, they don't say, well, damn, every time I went in there, it's a different dentist. How do you build a brand if the dentists keep rotating? Yeah, I think we we agree with you 100%. You said, you know, what is it what is a DSO but a but a larger group practice. We didn't we didn't like the term DSO. We didn't even want to use it to describe who we are. So we purposefully chose a, a dental partnership network. And I think it answers uh, your question around how do you, you know, every time a patient comes in, I, you know, they don't want to see a different dentist. Everything that we do in in building Guardian is about partnering with the dentist owners who started that group or started that practice. We're not a cookie cutter model. We're not stamping out um, some uh, model weight, waving a wand over their practice and changing everything to fit uh, what we think. You know, we're, we're moving lockstep with these partners who um, entrepreneurs who want to uh, join with us and we're figuring out what's best for them. You won't have that dentist turn over, uh, you know, every year or two, if they're well cared for, if they're, you know, Dr. Barrick had his amazing uh, retention of in his practices because he cares about his people. And he take, you know, you can tell stories, Dr. Barrick had about what you do for them. And that's the culture that we're building at, we're building at, uh, at Guardian. And that's, those are the kinds of groups also, by the way, where, that are attracted to us and, and see that it's a good cultural fit. I don't know, Dr. Barakat, what do you think? Yeah, that, that's very true. Howard, you know what? I, I graduated from dental school. I did the, the residency program. Um, I was supposed to be a periodontist. I got into a period program and I didn't, uh, two months before the program started, I decided to, to go to private practice. Um, didn't want to start on my own. I started in a group work I said, you know, I'll work with them for, for, you know, for a year. And my mentor and the owner of the group was a phenomenal dentist. And I stayed seven years. And it came to a point where I was like, okay, what's my next point? And I went on my own and moved about 250 miles away, started my own first practice. I'm like, okay, this is great. I can do this. I learned. I have done the group practice. I know how to grow beyond the one office and I did the second office and I did the third office and I thought the third office is going to run like the first office. That's not the truth. <laughs> it's a whole different animal when you go from one to two to three to five to seven to 10. Um, so that's, that's the learning process. And that's, that's, um, you know, the journey, but it all comes down to what a dentist wants. If you want to be on your own and build it one practice at a time and do your fair share of mistakes, you can do that. If you want to stay in one office, you can do that. But if you want to be with a group of like-minded people who are un dental entrepreneurs who you know will, will work with you, will support each other. So you can go beyond, you can avoid the pain and suffering of going from you know one to three to five to 10 to 20 on your own you have a group of people who think the same are have, are on the same journey and we're just partnering together maximizing what we can maximize as far as you know economies of scale but keeping our autonomy uh, doing our own thing um, you know we have we have a set of core values and uh, the, it's it's an impact core value and the i in the impact is individuality and that's what attracted me to guardian dental partners is that we are in our regions doing the same thing. We have our doctors, our patients, the relationships, the team members. You know, the patients come in and see the same doctor, the same owner, the name hasn't changed, the systems haven't changed. So that's that's what differentiates us from other DSOs. We're not a typical DSO that one size fits all. We are running our practices like we were with the support and aid of, uh, you know, the guardian dental partners and we're when we have a problem we pick up the phone we get on a zoom call and brainstorm it together and if we have a suggestion we run it by the partners first and see what everybody thinks and if it's a good idea we go for it so that's that's what's different uh, you know if you do it on your own this way this way and that way my own experience is this is this is the best way to go i couldn't have done you know beyond 10 on my own beyond 10 locations on my own 
So with everything you said, I'm. Su- why did you call it Guardian Dentistry instead of uh, Cleopatra and Alexander the Great? <laughs> Uh, Pyramid Dental Integration was the name of my <laughs> DSO before I joined Guardian. <laughs> so it was called Pyramid Dental Integration. And that's that's uh, we, you know where we started in Virginia. But uh, when we jo- joined Guardian and, and partnered with everybody else, Guardian, we guard our values. We guard what, our past. And Guardian is is the name that that was picked to 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 um, you know preserve that 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 past that we have um so when you say um i i noticed the, the reason i brought you on the show and thank you so much for coming on is how you're trying to distinguish yourself between a dso and a dpn so instead of being a dental services organization you want to be a dental partnership um, network. And I was wondering um, if you could expand on that. What, what, what does the devil in the details mean by that? What's the difference between a DSO and a DPN? I think that I think that's a pretty important point. It's a, it's a couple of letters different, but your question earlier, Howard, about, you know, what do you think dentists think about DSOs? We purposefully wanted to make sure that we're always laser-like focus on our our mission. Our mission is to um, support our dental entrepreneur partners and their teams in building the practices of their dreams. And that takes um, a partnership always, a focus on partnership. We have a set of values we call impact. Each letter stands for a value. The P in impact is partnership. It is all about uh, working side by side, hand in hand with the dentist to make sure that the decisions that we make are right for them, not just right for the, you know, whatever parent organization you want to call it. So that dental partnership network is is conscious. It's a conscious choice to differentiate ourselves. And, um, you know, we wake up every single day and, and you know, the, the exec team gets on the phone and we talk about, you know, how are we helping support our partners today? What are we doing for them? What have you done for them lately? What have you done for them this morning, today? Um, When we talk about new interests that we have, we talk about what's the right fit for this partner. What what can we do to help them? What do they need? We're not going to we're not going to partner with folks and put them in a position that that doesn't work for them. And that that, you know, not not that every, you know, DSO, um, you know, has a culture that that is uh, is uh, challenging for dentists to join. That's not the case whatsoever. But um, it is it's our guiding light. uh, P in partnership. So, you know, the, um, the long running, uh, joke and, um, and dentistry, um, that, uh, especially, uh, my friend, uh, Timothy Brown always talks about that the first four letters of partnership are part and dentists don't play along well in the sandbox. And, uh, it's, it's hard. I mean, with dental supplies, I mean, so many dental offices could lower the supplies if you just get the dentists to use the same bonding agent and you you know you you can't even get them to agree that today is Tuesday so how do you get you know if I had to have 50 people all get along together I I would go take over the start an army of young kids under 21 or go work at uh, Walmart where a majority don't have a high school diploma but man once you enter a law firm dental group practice, even the dental schools. My friends that work there like one day a week, you know, they make their money Monday, Thursday, but they just like to go in and teach the kids and they can barely go in there and have fun because of all the bullshit politics and all the fighting. So how do you get these guys to form a partnership when they're dentists and the first four letters are part? That's that's a fantastic question, Howard. I think, you know, the, the, the best part, I, I have worked on my own and I've worked, you know, to build my practices in my region. And I have come across a lot of DSOs and I explored all the options. I talked to different DSOs. I've, I've tried to learn their models, see what, what, you know, they have to offer. But the attractive part at Guardian is that when, when we partnered um, my, our region in Virginia with Guardian and I became the chief clinical officer, uh, for Guardian, I, I, you know, I knew the challenge was no two dentists will agree to using the same bonding agent. No two dentists will agree to using the same implant, and that's not what we're trying to do. We want to keep everybody. We want to keep everybody's autonomy and individuality the same. What we're trying to agree upon is, if you're going to place an implant, what is what is the what is the educational pathway to get there? If we want to serve our patients, what is the plan? to provide the best services. If you're gonna uh, you know, use the digital dentistry, how, what, what, the, what are the tools and what are the, what's the training? 
So we're trying to have high level conversation with the partners to agree on a plan that you know we can execute slightly differently, but we're not saying, hey, we're gonna change the bonding agent, we're gonna change you know everything you have to this, you know, a list of 10, 15 materials or 10, 15 things that we do. But if we find that it makes sense for us to and do all the partners agree or agree to like narrowing it down to the top five, then we're going to do that. If everybody says, no, I want to use my own material, my own instrument, my own bone graft, my own, you know, et cetera, then fine. And that's, that's the beauty of doing that partnership and having that conversation. Yeah, Howard, we've, we've won deals versus um, the bigs, who I'm sure you've had on your show, um, who have written bigger checks or offered bigger checks. But I think the answer to your question comes down, and, and I know it's kind of sometimes sounds a little squishy, but it's culture. You know, I had a, I had a uh, very, very senior leader at one of the, the organizations, the bigs that I knew, who used to say how culture is a bunch of touchy-feely BS, uh, you know, and values and mission and vision and all that stuff's a bunch of garbage. And I, I don't believe that. Uh, Dr. Barakat doesn't believe that. Our, our family that founded us um, doesn't believe that. Our, our family of dental entrepreneur partners who um, founded us uh, and contributed equity into the company believe that there's something special about having the right culture and the right culture. Um, you said P that the first four letters are part um, and dentists don't necessarily like to all agree and get along. That's okay. The I and impact in our values is individuality. It's okay. We actually like people to have differences and differences of opinion. We're going to be better. Dr. Barakat says one plus one equals 11, which I love. Um, we're going to be better when folks are able to come to the table with their own thoughts, their own opinions. We have uh, yeah, the T and impact is transparency. We have really good, healthy debates and conversations. Um, and then the C and impact is caring. But we do it in a way where folks know we care about you. The reason why we're having this healthy debate is because we think this is the right thing for you. I'm not going to jam it down your throat. We're not a cookie cutter uh, model, but we think it's the right thing. Let's talk about it. If you don't want to do it, hey, that's okay. Um, but we're here. We're here to try to support you the best way possible. And when sounds, you're talk- sounds fluffy, but it's real. No, um, when when you talk about your uh, the I and your impact statement, what what is that? That is that your mission? Is that on your website? It's our, it's our values. Yeah, if you go on our website, that's our values. Impact. Uh, so our values. So uh, it's it's impact. So I is individuality. Our differences make us stronger, and we love having people bring the best of themselves every day. The M stands for mentorship. We help each other learn and grow, whether it be through clinical, departmental, or personal relationships. The P is partnership. The only way we want to be successful is together, and we strive to learn from the best and share the rest, uh, which I want to come back to you for the next question. A is for action. We relentlessly pursue continuous improvement and take pride in doing things right and in doing the right thing. C, caring. We care about lives. We care about families. We care about the world. T, transparency. We will always be straight with one another and tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth with no politics and no drama. And lack of transparency um, and checks and balances is, I think, the most main two lessons we learned in the 5,000 years. Um, You can summarize all religion. My oldest sister... Um, is a is still a nun, and um, she told me that um, reading all the religious major works in their original language, the only thing they had in common, not a person, place, city, nothing, except for the golden rule, um, treat other people like you want to be treated. But when, I guess but when you're saying partnership, I'm, I'm thinking of a financial partnership. So when you, um, um, some dentist would join you, is it a financial partnership, or are you talking about an emotional partnership or are you talking about a financial partnership i mean are you growing this with dentists who own a piece of the pie yes we are so it's in every sense of the word yeah that's that's absolutely right howard um our dentist partners who come on board have skin in the game they are uh they feel like they're owners of their business because they are owners of their business they continue to own their practices we're we have an expression on our website you know we exist to preserve um, your past and protect your future. And preserving your past means you're going to continue to own that practice and treat it as if it is your own because it still is your own. You're going to have an equity um, stake in your practice or in your region, 
depending on what you're interested in. If you say, hey, listen, I want to become a bigger leader in the region. I want to help lead other doctors, train other doctors. The partnership uh, definition that we have is, okay, let's talk about that. What's the right fit? How would that work? How many days are you in the chair? Do you want to get out of the chair? Should we help you get out of the chair? So it's not only a financial arrangement in terms of partnership, but it's the way we work together as well. And what do you, what, what need are you um, meeting? Do you think with these dentists when, when, when they're looking for um, this, what, what do you think's driving it? I mean, what, what do you, what do you think? Uh, um, what needs are you meeting? What, why is this successful? I mean, you're, you're coming up yeah. on 50 offices. I know. Um, I mean, with the worst yeah. timing in the world, I mean, right before a <laughs> pandemic. So obviously yeah. you're, you're going to the market with something that's needed. And I saw the DSO brand uh, explode positive. I mean, I mean, people started to see why when a yak gets threatened, um, they all form a circle, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's some hyenas coming around and it's called Corona. So what, what, what needs are you meeting the most for these guys? I, I think, honestly, at the end of the day, when they see us, experience us, meet us, listen to us, they understand that, boy, I don't think I'm going to be miserable selling my practice, partnering with these folks. What's the last thing you want to do? You built this, Dr. Barakat built his practices, worked so hard, an amazing culture with his teams, wonderful people there. And there's a big unknown. He could he could collect a check from an organization and then his life could become wholly, you know, excuse the French, you know, miserable heck um, after that. And he doesn't want that. It's not worth the check. And I think for dentists, why why is their interest? Why, why do they like what they're hearing and what they're seeing, and what they're experiencing? Talk to our partners. I think it's because they get, man, I'm enjoying building a, a special company. This network, the the end, the partnership network is truly like a family and folks here are working together to the best of their ability to try to build something special because we want to have an impact, a positive impact in the industry. It's why, it's why we're doing this. And the family who founded us, that's what, what attracted me to the company and why I joined is because I could feel that they truly care about doing the right thing and, and really care about the dentists and care about the partners. First thing that the that they do when they're on the phone with Dr. Barakat is ask how he is, how's his family, how are his children, how does he like his his role, what does he need, how can they help? That's the conversation. Well, see, I I know my dentist, and when they hear some Italian guy Mark Soprano saying the family, <laughs> they're thinking, "Shit, man, is this the mob? Am I selling my dental <laughs> office to the mob? I sold my office to the Sopranos." Uh, yeah, That's I, I don't. Right. I, I, don't know, family, I don't know if Italian family. people can use the word family. Uh, maybe you should say uh, my mom and brother. But um, so, um, yeah, they, um, I want to ask another thing. Um, you, you know, when they, when they um, we talk about millennials where, you know, they, they stay at um, Amazon the shortest one year. Facebook actually keeps them longest. And that's only two years. Um, you know, um, so keeping a young millennial is tough. And, um, but when you do keep them, they, um, they always say the same thing. They say, I said, well, why did you stay there? Well, I thought if I stayed there, I'd learn how to place implants or I'd learn how to do, they're always chasing a mentor. It's, I mean, they tell you, it's not like, well, we did a survey. Hell you, it's kind of like when you sit down and you, um, uh, meet someone who's a vegan, it just takes like three seconds and you know, they're a vegan because they're going to tell you three times in three seconds. The young dentists always tell you. That they um, they're, they're looking for a mentor. They're 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 young. They're right out of school. That they're aware that they don't know their ass from second base, and they want to go work somewhere where they're gonna grow their skills and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, do you is that do you agree? Is that a hundred percent? A hundred percent. This is when we sat down to put our core values. We brought in our experiences from you know our individual um, you know uh, uh, journey. Uh, whether, you know, Mark with, with his previous experiences and, and myself and Danny and, you know, and we sat down and we said, what is it that will make us different? And I personally, you know, grew to be a better person because I had mentors, not just in dentistry, in finances, in, in life. And I still speak with, talk to them all the time. So if we go back to our core values, the, the, the M in impact is mentorship. And we live, breathe, go by it, day in and day out and this is how i i i you know 
value um, our associates and our doctors because we spend time um, talking to them, tra training them, answering their questions, guiding them, holding their hands. And like you said, exactly what you said, the millennials want a mentor. They want, us, they want somebody to help them out, to guide them. And if, you, if you're genuine and you're authentic and you're transparent uh, and, and you mentor them, there, there's nowhere else they would go. And if they want to go, hey, you know what? You've, you've passed it along. Somebody else mentored me and I did my own journey. I'll be very happy for them. But it's their choice. And we want to put them on, a, on, a, on, a, you know, on, a, on the right journey that's good for them. Open their eyes, hold their hands, and mentor them. And then they can make the decision after that. And with the way dentistry is headed, I think, um, you know, coming out with, you know, these huge school loans and, you know, uh, starting your own practice, it's it's going to get harder and harder. So you want to be in a group where you have mentors, you have people who will hold your hands, grow you and grow with them and have a good financial uh, outcome out of it. Uh, you know, whether it's you want to start buying in, we have, you know, like, for example, we have our associate partnership track. So associates who stay with the company and, you know, are mentored and they want to take it to the next level, this, we put them on a, on a partnership track in their own individual practice or even the region. We want to do that. That's how we want to retain our doctors. They want us, we want it to be a career, not just a job that they are in for two, three years and then leave. That's not our goal. Well, you know, it's kind of funny because um, the, the first thing I do when, um, you know, dentists are, I mean, they're all really smart. I mean, you couldn't get into dental school unless you got A in calculus and geometry and trig. I mean, dentists are one of the only people that you can sit down next to and they can figure out the area of a triangle. I mean, they're, they're just exceptional people. <laughs> and, I mean, they really are incredibly smart. My boys picked this up before they were 10. They're like, uh, Dad, you know, when I go spend the night at any friend's house, um, there's no books in the house. But every one of your dentist friends has a library in his house. At that time, they just knew it was a library. I mean, these are general deals. It's kind of like the first time I took him on a missionary dentist trip. It was so adorable. My oldest was like six, and, and this is a really poor area. And he said, Dad, how come they don't have any trampolines? Uh, that was the only thing he saw missing, you know, was that they didn't have trampolines in their backyard. I'm like, yeah, they don't have trampolines and a whole bunch of other stuff. But my, my, my boys all figured out the, the book reading thing. I mean, God dang, dentists are so overread um, that, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's just amazing. So I said, if all these smart dentists, you know, if, if the business model isn't quite there yet, I was going to start looking at the other uh, challenge with law firms, Consulting groups, Price Waterhouse, Boston Consulting. So I was looking for my own patients and calling patients and started to talk to them. Like, and, and they all said the same. They all said the same thing. Lawyers aren't gonna play on the same team if they always think they're just gonna be an employee. You, they have to have light at the end of the tunnel that maybe one day they'll make partnership. And we know a lot of them aren't going to make partnership because they're not going to work hard. They're not going to hustle. They're not going to share our values. They're not going to be the right fit. But, man, you join our law firm and you work your butt off. You work like no man has for five years. Yeah, someday you'll make partner. But when they go work at most of these DSOs, I mean, they, they, they know from day one you're, you're a grunt and you work Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. We pay you 25% of production and you'll, always, and you'll die a grunt. And that's not the how right. you keep. Right people you know, at Boston and Price Waterhouse. You, you, hit the nail on the heads. You, you hit the nail on the head. The reason why I, I worked with an amazing group for seven years uh, right after graduation and the reason why I left and I loved every single person there and I love my mentor there is because there was no partnership. There was no pathway to partnership. There was no pathway to partnership even if I affiliate in a different region. And that's, that's, the, that's maybe the two cents that we try to do differently in, in, in Guardian is we don't want to do the same thing that happened to us and myself and my partners uh, in Virginia. We worked in the same group. We went, left, started on our own practices, and then we came together again and partnered together. And the reason why we left from the get-go is because we were never offered a pathway to partnership, never thought that we're going to own it like we wanted to. And that's what we're different. This is where we're different. We have true partnership for associates. We have a, a pathway to partnership. Um, you have to, you know, be the right fit and you have to, you know, embrace the, the, the partnership. So it won't be a part, like you said, it will be a partnership. 
And I wish. If, go ahead, Mark. No, I was going to say I wish you could be a fly on the wall tonight, uh, Howard. We have uh, yes. a doctor development yes. series tonight, yep. seven to nine p.m. So uh, you talk about uh, you know grunts that may be working at other practices. We're, we'll probably have forty doctors on tonight on Zoom, and the topic is perio. And if you were on, you would hear um, laughter. You would hear folks from different um, states talking to each other. So I, I realized that I joined the company a month before COVID. Most of the folks have never actually met each other face to face, but it's as if um, we all know each other because of that spirit um, of inclusion and, and family and feeling like you're part of something that actually gives a crap about you for sure. And that, that's, a, that's a difference maker. And then the, but the, the proof's in the pudding though. So when we have partners like Dr. Barakat and our other docs in the other states, uh, when we hook our wagons up together and we partner, are we partnering? Uh, is it the right fit where those folks truly care about their dentists? They want to train them. They want to mentor them. They want to care for them. They're not just selling to us and saying, here, you take it. I don't want to, I don't want to be bothered anymore. That that's, that's not what we're all about. Um, that, that is amazing. Um, I think, um, the, the dentist, um, they're, they're, if they're going to be this, well, well first of all, I, I'm going to ask you a question first, cause you, you came from Aspen where you had incredible, um, um, brand. Obviously you can't have up unless there's down. You can't have right without left. You can't have addition without subtraction or multiplication without division. And it's always a red flag when someone's trying to sell you something and you just simply do the inverse of it and, and it doesn't work. And so one marketing deal is like Aspen. They're all the same brand. They're the same cookie cutter. All the, the patients all see the same. The opposite of that is what you're doing where you have all these offices and their name, Mark and Fred and Tim and uh, whatever. So what's the pros and cons? Um, um, you can't have one without the other. So what's the pro of <laughs> everything's Aspen one box cookie cutter? And what's the, uh, what's the con of the other side? I mean, sure. And, and which one would get you more new patients? I mean, just, just talk about that for a second first. Yeah, Aspen, Aspen Dental, amazingly successful. I had a, a great experience there. Um, Dual-edged sword. The, the fact that you can market and build brand awareness for a single brand in the market. So you can build 18 practices in Atlanta and spend uh, a bunch of money in marketing and it benefits all 18. So you can outspend the individual mom and pops by a mile. Um, and that's that's a positive. The the flip side of that is when something not so nice happens, it could take the entire ship down. The day the week that I joined Aspen Dental, there was a special that ran on PBS Frontline called Drilling for Dollars, and the whole special was about how Aspen Dental is ripping people off and is uh, charging uh, uh, folks uh, too much money, over treatment planning them, selling them things they don't want. Pros and cons, but on the uh, you know on the flip side, and, and mo most of I guess the DSO models are probably non-branded. I I would imagine uh, in the country, uh, it's okay. Dr. Barakat started the Smiles Group, and in Pennsylvania we have affordable dental uh, solutions. Um, we have uh, Fresh Dental in North Carolina. Folks take a lot of pride in those brands and built them up in their markets. And uh, who are we to come in and say? You know, you you should change that to some you know parent corporate brand because we have better marketing efficiencies. Uh, you know, the the downside is it's a little bit harder to build awareness. The downside is you know we've acquired practices where it's named after the dentist who eventually wants to retire, so we will have to do something about that. But but the, our business model is preserving preserving the past, protecting the future. It's okay. It's okay if you have different brand names. We're not going to change that on you. You built it up. Your team members, your doctors take pride in it, and we're going to support you. And we can be successful. You asked about driving patient traffic. Uh, we're doing we're doing pretty well right now, driving the traffic that we need um, as a company across the board coming out of out of COVID. Um, knock on wood, we're we're feeling very fortunate that we've been as successful as we are. And uh, Aspen Dental is a machine, and it can drive a heck of a lot of patient traffic. Whether or not those folks will continue. Um, to come back and there'll be patients for life, you know, don't know. It's a, potentially a bit of a different experience that you get when you go into an Aspen versus Dr. Barakat's um, Vienna Smiles location. 
Yeah, um, and, and I would tell the kids, he said something great. He said, you know, um, it's a dual-edged sword. It cuts both ways. And I'm here to tell you that that's how the universe works. It, um, the, the universe, I mean, it's up, down, left, right. You can't have hot without cold. So you're always asking me when you're young, well, is this is this right or do you think that's wrong? I, I don't go with right and wrong. I go with, um, you know, what's the trade-off? Um, everything has a trade-off. And if you're not aware of the trade-off, I assure you only one thing, you are not. You don't know what you're doing yet and just keep studying more because everything has a trade-off. And what he just said is everybody's named Aspen. It lowers your marketing costs. You spend less money marketing, you drive more traffic. The bad news is when uh, shit happens. I mean, if you have a, a barrel of apples, one of them's gonna be bad. But could you imagine in 2012 when Frontline Comes out with a big story. Patience, pressure, and profits at Aspen Dental. That was eight years ago. And I also want to say something else to a lot of dentists um, who get mad at me whenever I post something um, bad about dentistry. They, they want me that I'm supposed to be some shill for dentists and, you know, just, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> the reason I show it to you is because your patients are seeing it. And I don't want you to be sitting there blindsided and say, oh, do you hear about the dentist that did that? And you're like, what, what, what? Um, but people are always saying that. Why do you, why do you post this shit? Um, because um, <laughs> PBS posted it. Uh, so PBS can run with the story, but little old Howie can't. I mean, I mean, are you out of your freaking mind? When something makes the front page of the LA Times, uh, don't ask why did Howard post it. Ask why the hell... The LA Times post it and your patients are going to see it. But hey, were you there, Mark, during that time? Um, yes. Um, how do you, um, my gosh, well, first of all, congratulations. I figured you'd be in, a, um, you know, the Betty Ford Clinic by now. I mean, <laughs> could you imagine my little snowflake dentist if they made it on the TV like this? I mean, they, 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 they whine over a review on Yelp. I mean, it's like, oh, God. When they, when they, <laughs> When they start doing that, I'm like, what, you, you got out of dental school and you didn't know that one-fourth of the planet humans are batshit crazy? They cry <laughs> over a Yelp review. I mean, they, seriously, some of, them, some of them are still crying a year later. You survived PBS, Frontline, millions of views. Everybody talked about it. It was eight years ago, it seems like yesterday. So what do you do? Do you go into bunker mode do you say like my uh, some people say well if you stir shit it makes a stink so just everybody lay low say nothing and america's attention span is about eight seconds and just let it blow over and come back up what, what how did you handle that what was your strategy when this happened maybe counterintuitive and you said that for every hot there's a cold um i focus first internally i know that that sounds probably crazy, which is PBS Frontline's out there, they're running this special, and my goodness, you know, you're, you're, you've are you're got to go out there and, and, you know, make a counterclaim. Started internally, started with, hang on a second, is that us? Is that what we're doing? Is that the culture that we have? Is that, what are our values in this organization? And went on a learning journey to understand truly when everybody gets up in the morning and comes in and they're, and they're having their best day, what does it feel like? Why do they get up every day? Why do they do what they do? So we rebranded, kind of re, refocused the company. It launched a new mission, vision, and values for the company. Um, sort of rebranded internally in terms of rallying folks around, hey, this, this is who we really are. And that preceded our external um, messaging by, you know, six, seven, eight, nine months. Um, it's the same thing, you know, kind of founding Guardian, sort of from the ground up. We have the ability to set... Um, a little bit different than Aspen's situation, but from from day one, set um, you know our soul in place, firmly in place for who we are, what we're all about, how we're going to act, how we're going to behave, and uh, you know you no matter what what we used to say is it's great if we try to tell our story. This is back in my former former life when we were getting you know yelled at and dragged through the mud. It's great if we try and tell our story. It's even better if other people tell it for us. And that's what we that's what we strove for. What can we do that's positive in the world? How can we create a change for patients? Create a change for folks in need. We started uh, started a movement of taking care of folks in need. And uh, you know, when I first joined Guardian, Dr. Barakat, very first thing he said is, "We need to um, have mission trips for Guardian." I mean, we're about this big at the time. The first thing on his mind is, "How do we help people?" And that's that's what I love. That's why I love everybody. Uh, you know, who we work with day in and day out. Let's let's change. That's, let's I mean, yeah, let's change the world. 
That's I agree with you, Mark. I think this is our differentiator. We're, you know, we all make mistakes, but but uh, you know, the, with the partnership that we have and the values that we have as a starting company, and the the, the great calibers that we have, like Mark, and and the rest of our leadership team uh, members, um, we're trying to avoid the mistakes, but we're not, you know, we're, we're not shy to dis, you know, to disclose them and discuss them internally and externally if there is any, but. The, the best part is that we we immediately go back to our core values. We go back to who we are. Why did we come together from the first, um, you know, from the first place? And, uh, you know, there's so much that we were, uh, we had lined up in 2020. Uh, it's just a little setback uh, with the mission trips, the things like, like you, Mark, mentioned here. But we're going back on track in 2021. That's that's what we want to do. We want to we want to show the partners, so show our patients and our community who we are and uh, giving back is one big thing that we always talk about and we, we've done so dental towns had classified ads since day one and there's always been about 1,000 dental offices for sale and 4,000 ads for uh, an associate pandemic comes along and now it doubled to 2,000 dentists for selling that they're out they don't want to deal with this. And the five, uh, the 4,000 jobs has shrank to 1,000. So my first question is, um, if someone wants to sell your their practice to Guardian, uh, do they have to stay? I mean, some dentists just want out. Um, are you a house of liquidity where you will buy an office and take it from there? Or do you only buy uh, if the doctor stays on and is a partner? That's a fantastic question. I think... Our biggest attraction is uh, being who we are um, as dental partners. We want the doctors. We prefer to have the doctors stay with us. Our 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 strength is, you know, staying together. I'll give you an example. There's a story that actually that I always um, go back to when when a doctor comes in and 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 you know explores us and says, "Hey, you know, I heard about you from my friend. What are you guys all about?" I think. Uh, that specific dentist who lives in our area here in Virginia uh, was on his own and he was referred. We actually, by the way, we get a lot of referrals from our colleagues and the partners that joined us. And if you say word of mouth is the best way to grow in dentistry uh, for from patient to patient, this is word of mouth is the best way Guardian is growing from, from partner to partner. And people hear about us and they approach us. So we were approached by this dentist who said, what are you guys doing differently? I, I'm tired of running my own practice. I want to be part of you. Do you, do you guys, are you guys going to want me to stay on board or not? Uh, what are you guys all about? So after going through our core values and who we are and what's going on, and he met uh, other dentists that, that rolled their practices with us. It made perfect sense for him to come over, bring his patients, bring his space, and join one of our locations. So we merged his practice to ours. And uh, I said, you know what, doc, this is who we want you to be the lead doctor for that location with your expertise and experience with our support. Let's let's just grow bigger. So we are, we would love to have doctors that join us, whether with their own practices or join us with their groups um, and stay on board and and pick what they want to do. They want to work three days. That's fine. Do you want to work two days? That's OK. Do you want to work full time? Absolutely fine. But we just want partners and doctors joining us that would stay and contribute. Um, they set their own schedule. They set what they want to do, what they don't want to do. But it's always better uh, for us as a group of partners is to have par partners that can come and join. Yeah. Don't you agree with that, Mark? Yeah. I don't, I don't think, Howard, to, you know, to answer your question, I don't think we're in the business of just providing liquidity, buying buying a book of business, or buying you know the assets, chairs, and and uh, equipment, I think we're we're in the business of um, investing in uh, people who are the right partners who can help us build something special. At least at this point, right now, we're 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 super young. We're a whopping you know nearly two years old uh, now. So and uh, will that change in the future? Maybe. But right now, we want folks to come on on the bus uh, who want to want to create some change and, and build a special organization and truly be partners, build up our network. Okay, so if you're uh, so um, my my homies know math. I mean, they they want to know is it EBITDA? Do do you have? I mean, is there an exact formula? I mean, uh, can can you tell your your formula if someone's thinking about you know becoming a partner with you guys? What is it an exact formula? 
Uh, I think it's not an exact formula only because there's different pathways um, to structure equity. We don't force a doctor to roll over. This is the percentage you must roll over um, into the organization. Um, we have our structure of our deals um, can be, hey, if you want to um, partner with us and you want to roll over this much equity, fine. This much equity, fine. Um, if you want to structure it where um, uh, you want a more cash up front, you want uh, less less of an earnout. You know, we have these conversations. These are you know, negotiations or just finding the right fit. Ideally, we'd actually want folks to have more skin in the game because I think the more skin in the game that they have, the more committed they are um, to continue to lead the practice so successfully, which is what you know got us interested in the first place. But from an EBITDA multiple standpoint, there are folks right now in the industry, and this is the T in impact transparency. We're not really happy with uh, folks who are... Uh, being a, let's let's just say a below uh, not above board with the dentist they will throw a lot of complicated um, math at the dentist that might look great in fact we just uh, you know brokers will bring us deals and they'll help us understand what some of them look like um, they'll try to lowball the dentist but make it look like they're not and that's not what we're all about you will know absolutely clearly here is your EBITDA here is the multiple that we're offering you we're not counting your compensation in that. We're not counting your 401k in that. We just uh, you know, heard about a, a, um, uh, a presentation that was made where everything in the sun was thrown into the number to make it look better. It's not That's not right. Our, our multiples will be competitive. Um, we may not be the biggest check, but you, you know that you're going to be part of something special and, moving uh, forward. One major thing that attracted me to Guardian, and that, Mark, I know um, – this this was a huge point uh, when I first met uh, you know Danny and 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 the managing partners um, was the first thing they said our dollar is as green as your dollar or your dollar is as green as our dollar which means there is no gain there is transparency you put in X it's equivalent to the X that we put in there is no you know convoluted formulas to minimize the doctor partner's share compared to um, the actual founders of the company and the investor, uh, the family, the family um, office. So that that was a huge attraction because I, I looked at different models and it was so convoluted, confusing. This was very transparent and it was clear and um, we honor that. And that's, that's a huge attraction. Whether you want to roll in X or you want to roll in 2X into the equity, that's something that's tailored based on what your needs and what you want to do. But whatever you put in uh, in the partnership, you invest in the partnership, you roll over, it's as green as Guardian's dollars. And that's 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 our differentiator right there. Yeah. So is Mark going to do a big marketing campaign like uh, our partnership won't be nearly as bad as your marriage or things like that? I mean, it's like, <laughs> say <not>. marriage. <laughs> If you think your marriage is bad, no, uh, um, yeah, it's uh, well, it, it's tough because you know I tell young kids they're trying to go get a job, um, the dentist. You know, a lot, a lot of times they'll call me and they'll say, "Well, I got a dental school. I went back to my small town in nowhere, Arizona, and uh, there's two jobs available. And one will pay me twenty five percent and pay all my bills. The other will pay me thirty percent, but I got to pay half my lab bills. Which one would you take?" And I'm and I'm always like, well, "You said the the culture." I'm like. Well, does one dentist have staff that's been there 10, 20, 30 years and the other office, no one's been there too? I mean, um, you know, and, and when you say, uh, well, this one's better at implants, I, I don't know how you can be good at implants if you never see your cases after two years. I mean, I, I remember when I got my um, fellowship in the admissions to my diplomats and implants, I mean, you, you don't find it when you come out of school, you think you're a great dentist first year because nothing fails. Hell, after five years, you realize, oh, my God, they shouldn't have given me a license. I was trying to sue my dental school, <laughs> saying, what idiot trained this guy? Uh, so so what is your mentorship looking at? Is it clinical dentistry? Is it re human relationship? I'll tell you this. 
as crazy as it sounds, it's a lot easier to do a root canal and a bone graft and place an implant than figure out how to get two humans to get along. Humans are the most complicated thing on earth. Um, we, we just had an election. I mean, I'm 58. I've watched a lot of elections. I mean, my God, these, this was a razor sharp, close election. There are two and people say, you know, I can't believe the other team or whatever. Well, it's just like your kids. I got four kids. And, um, you know, I grew up with five sisters today. I mean, I still wanted to ask my mom, Mom, are you really her mom? I mean, come on, you can tell me. Is she adopted? <laughs> There's no way she can be my sister. How the hell? So, I mean, people are just complex. And, and if you still think what's really complex is finding the MB2 and the fourth canal, my God, you, you're not even smart enough to know how complex people are. They're just incredibly complex. And that's why dentistry, I still think it was a very, very, what were we thinking when we picked dentistry? I mean, um, I mean, you look at, uh, well, I mean, you take humans. Um, you know, take a newborn baby. You can Q-tip their ears and you can check every part of their body. You try to go in their mouth, the baby freaks out. And um, uh, anthropologists say that, you know, when, when humans have been killed for the last million years, usually they're on the ground and a carnivore has got a clamp on their throat. The last thing you want to do with a human is lay them on their back and have them lift up their chin and expose their throat because that's how they've died the last million years to hyenas, lions, and tigers. And, I mean, we were so close to the nose. Why didn't we become an ENT? I mean, we missed the dream job by an inch, and then we went in their mouth. And uh, there all the fear takes over, and they're afraid, and they're not trusting. And that's why um, I think on um, – that's why I never started a group practice. It's why I never started DSO. I mean, I had a million opportunities for it, but I just thought, my gosh, it's so complicated just to get along with the patient and your assistant and your receptionist. I mean, HR is everything. So that's, that's my question. How do you excel – in relationships and human capital in HR. I mean, I mean the worst job in any company, it's not the marketing department. If you think the worst job in a company is the marketing or the accounting, whatever, the worst job is HR. And if you, and, and if you don't understand that that's the hardest job in business, then you know nothing about business. So how do you, how do you do the HR? How do you, how do you get people playing in the sandbox without throwing buckets at each other? Mark, I'll take the clinical part and, and the relationship <laughs> part, and you take <laughs> the rest. Hey, thanks. You know, Howard, I, m both my parents are dentists, by the way, and periodontists. And I, I grew up in a family that, that was involved in dentistry. So, uh, how did I get into dentistry? Uh, I had no choice, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Probably my dad gave me an offer I can't refuse, <laughs> but I had to go into <laughs> dentistry. But dentistry is 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 um, intense. It is um, you know tedious. But yes, you can teach a dentist how to place an implant, and you know number ten implants gonna be better than number one, and number hundred you know the hundredth implant is gonna be better than the number ten. Um, the relationships that we have with our patients is what makes us successful. We are in the relationship business. Yes, we are very skilled, uh, you know, uh, doctors and clinicians. But what makes a very, an exceptional dentist from a, a good dentist is the relationship they have with their patients. And same goes with the team members. So one of the things that we um, are in the process of doing that I did in Virginia, and I think this is a great thing that all of Guardian is implementing as, as we speak right now, is we're sitting down with individual team members and saying, you know, trying to sit down with them and say, what's your genius? What's going to make you special? What are you after? Do you want to do you want to make money? Do you want to be a better parent? Do you want to be more, you know, financially successful? We sat down with our team members and we said, what's your genius? What is it that you're good at doing? What is it that you like to do? And if you have the intersection of both, that's your genius. If we can get people to work around their genius, this is how you eliminate all the drama and all the craziness uh, that human beings have sometimes. And, and you know, this is not a one-time task. This is something that you revisit all the time. If you get people to work in their genius, people will like to teach and they're great dental assistants. Well, can you teach other dental assistants how good you are? Can you take what you have in your mind and, you know, teach it to other people? Oh, I love to teach and I'm a good dental assistant. I'm a great dental assistant. So why don't you do that? How do you feel about that? Oh, I love it. 
And now it's not work anymore. There's no craziness anymore. And you're transferring that uh, culture across different regions. And that's that's the beauty of what we have. What's working, we're doing best practices among our regions. And what's going well with human beings and human relationships and patient relationships, we're taking the best practices and taking it to the other region and say, hey, North Carolina, what do you think of this? We're doing this, or Michigan, or you know, Pennsylvania. Try this. It has worked really well for us. We built the team lead. We built you know these relationships with our patients. It's a relationship business with our patients. It's a relationship with our with our team members, and that's that's what makes us different. And that's that's what I learned from my mentors, from my parents, and you know from my previous experiences. That's what my partners know, and we're trying to get the best practices. So. The fact that your mom and dad were both dentists and you're a dentist, did you uh, like stop and uh, have yourself sterilized so that this recessive gene wouldn't be passed on <laughs> again and again? Do you think it was a genetic uh, recessive gene or did you decide to reproduce that offspring uh, regardless? I'll tell you one thing. Both my parents are periodontists. And they're still married to this day, as far as I know. <laughs> but the one thing I knew in my genes that I don't want to marry a dentist. I wanted to marry somebody who is not a dentist. So if there's one thing that I wanted to change, <laughs> because you know they 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 graduated the same year, they got married, they they did their specialty, graduated the same time, and got their PhDs the same time and same day actually. But it's hard. It's hard when you, when your, you know, your partner is doing exactly what you're doing, and they decided to work separately in separate offices to have that break from each other. But I think having, um, you know, my partners um, and what we're doing right now, we we basically we have to communicate. We have to talk. We have we have to brainstorm all the time. What's working for you? What's what's are you in your genius? Are you doing what's best? for you that reflects on the rest of the team members. And that's that's the process that we're trying to integrate. So if you, if you think individuality, yes, we make our own decisions on our composites and our bondings, but what is the action part? What are we trying to do to get us to a different place? We're trying to take action, sit down with our team members, take the time to find their genius and help them grow it. And that's, that's where we're headed with this. And Howard, realize, it would be boring if uh, people weren't crazy, wouldn't it? Oh, absolutely. And oh, that's really you're cool. right. The, the, no, uh, yeah, I mean, so, drama's fun. They're, they're the life of the party. I don't know if I'd want to have him uh, be my assistant during a root canal. But what is the, um, so you're telling um, a kid out of dental school, for, for, first of all, I mean, nobody in private practice uh, wants to hire these kids out of school. And that, that's where I see, um, I can call red flags the bullshit where, um, you know, where, I remember back in the 80s, you come out of school, all the cosmetic dentists, um, you know, they show these crowded cases, you know, then the next slide, all all the teeth are filed down for a PFM, and you're just like, oh, my God. I mean, we're talking about discoloration and crowding. Now I'm looking at, like, 10 rice kernels, upper and lower. It's like, to me, I just, I, I was shocked. And, um, and then I, but I knew they knew it was wrong because I knew when it was their children, they got bleaching and braces. And it's like, well, why are you treatment planning differently for your patient than you are your daughter? That, that, that was a total red flag uh, for me. Um, so on these uh, dentists, um, the dentists will complain about the DSOs, but they won't hire kids straight out of school. And I mean, I can tell you every old guy in this town, I mean, we've all done it. You hire a young kid out of school and it's like, it takes them uh, about 40 days and 40 nights to do a DO. Um, you know, if it's an <laughs> MOD, my God, the patient's gonna have to move in. You're gonna have to, I mean, nobody wants them. Um, do you take kids out of dental kindergarten and give them a job right out of school or do they have to wait a year or two? And then what is the mechanism when you're saying, um, like, like indentured servants, you know, they, they give you a ride from Ireland. Uh, my, my family tree came here 40 years before they, uh, um, Ellis Island. And, um, the, you know, they came here and a lot of them were carried over here and they had to work for seven years for whoever transport them. They were, um, so how long do they have to work for you before they start building a credit towards buying in? Oh, that's a fantastic question. I think, um, you know, we prefer to have um, dentists who with residency training. Having said that, um, we have doctors who are fresh out of school that joined us. 
But during the interview, I'm, I'm, I, you know, you can, like you said, you can teach a dentist how to become the best they could be. There is a learning curve. There's a learning process. But if they have the personality and, and, uh, and the humility to, to learn, uh, I'll take them in a heartbeat. Um, you know, a lot of grads from dental school, they think that this is it. They've known it all. They know it all. They, they, um, they just, they're ready to roll. Um, and during that interview process for a fresh grad or right before they graduate, I want to just see if they have the capacity and the mental capacity and ability to learn. And they say, yes, I don't know what I don't know. Teach me. I'm looking for a mentor. These are the doctors that we want to nurture, help, guide, mentor, and hold their hands. Um, doctors with residency training, they're amazing. But they still have a lot of learning to do. I still have a lot of learning to do after 22 years. We know that dentistry is very humbling sometimes. So that's the kind of conversation we have. So there is no one straight yes or no. We don't take dentists out of, fresh out of school or we take dentists only with residency. It depends. It depends on the dentist, their personality, how they want to grow. And that's the assessment that we do. But once they to... join, go ahead, Mark. No, go please. But once they join, we have an onboarding uh, plan for them. We want them to shadow for a certain amount of time. We want them to work with a senior doctor or senior, senior uh, clinical leader in the region to assess their skills, help them out, hold their hands, have a plan for them. So the onboarding period is very important. And then after that, we make them work or have them work with a doctor in the same practice. So they're not on their own. We don't want to get a dentist who just did the, finished the onboarding program and then go take care of an office it's it's hard and it's tough so we we kind of have them tag team with a doctor work as an associate do their things hold hands in the same location and then we help them on an educational pathway to get better at endo get a, get better at crowns uh, and crown and bridge if they want uh, you know scanning digital dentistry once they hit a certain landmark or a, a, or what's a, 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 a milestone, then they're, we're grooming them to become partners if they want to. And we discuss the partnership pathway with them. Um, it depends that, on That's funny how you do that differently, how you have the onboarding for your new uh, employees, whereas yes. I have the waterboarding. And, uh, <laughs> that's for the patients. <laughs> the yeah, waterboarding just, is for the patients. We just torture them. Um, I, I, I'm going to, for, first of all, we've gone over an hour. Um, thank you guys so much. Uh, do you have some time for some more uh, overtime questions? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I'd love to keep you on. Um, how, you know, I, um, you know, these kids come out with $400,000 of student loans, and, um, you know, I, I'm not really into the bleaching bonding veneer thing because my my own psyche of uh, I, di I didn't go to school to make someone prettier. And even though that's great and it helps your self esteem, I mean, my 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 mindset was a toothache. You know, someone someone coming in holding their face, someone who couldn't sleep last night. That that that's my that that's what gets me going. Uh, my like uh, um, you know, I I just uh, th that's my biggest motivational and half the kids that come out of dental school have already decided they're done with endo. I mean, they already hate it. They're like, no, no, I, I did that twice and it was awful. And then to make it worse, their mom starts chiming in. I know I hate endo too. And I'm like, don't say that your daughter can hear you. Um, and, um, what do you, what, how do you turn a young mind around who's already made up her mind that she hates endo when it's something that's, public health it has to be done eight percent of america's emergency room patients are odontogenic in order in, in, in origin because the dentists who say they're oh yes we're very patient centric we're not dentist focused we're patient focused really monday through thursday eight to five give me a break eight and a half percent of all the emergency room visits are odontogenic in origin and you're patient centric you're if you even believe that Hopefully you're drunk. I mean, hopefully you're watching this at a bar. Uh, but if, if you really think dentistry is patient-centered and you think that sober, you're, you're out of your mind. And what I, um, from a public health, um, is one of the 12 specialties. They're all like, um, it really shows up when uh, a dental office won't do a uh, root canal or won't extract a tooth. If you can't get someone out of pain by pulling the tooth or doing the root canal, you're not even a doctor. I mean, really, at that point, you're not. Um, so how do you 
how how do you make someone love something they hate? They hate endo, and how do you mentor them around it? That's a fantastic question. I think the conversation would be as follows. You know, every doctor that comes out of residency or, or out of dental school, they want to place their first implant. And I, I'm like, okay, absolutely. I would support you, help you to do your first implant. But during the onboarding part, I, I want to make sure you can extract the tooth. If you want to be in an, if you want to be a partner one day, you will be in an office by yourself. And if you're in an office by yourself, I want to make sure that you can take care of the patients that show up. If a patient calls you over the weekend, can you extract the tooth? Can you start a palpotomy? Can you get the patient out of pain? Can you prep a crown predictably? And let's go ahead and restore the tooth, do an implant later, but I want to make sure you can check these boxes. I want to make sure that you know how to do it. Uh, we give them the tools, we give them the, 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 you know, the education, we give them the mentorship to do that through our partner companies, through our specialists that we have in, in our group. Um, I, I don't, every doctor that joins us doesn't have to do second molar endos, doesn't have to do complex curved roots, doesn't have to do retreats. The doctors that join us, we want to make sure they can do, get the patient out of pain, do premolar, anteriors, you know, first molar endo predictably using the tools that we have. And we simplify it and we hand them the tools, we hand them the training, we hand them, uh, you know, the, the, the manifesto to get good at that. Now, do they want to treat every single endo that comes in? No, because again, it's back to the patient. We want to serve the patient the best. We have specialists, we have endodontists that rotate through our group sometimes in some regions more than others. And you know what? You can refer to the endodontist, but you have to be able to get the patient out of pain. What if he's on vacation? So that's the basic conversation that we have. We are here to serve our patients. We are here to get the patients out of pain. We're here to do the basic dental procedures, get good at it, get comfortable with it. Take your time. I'm here to assist you and help you. Let's do it together. Let's do it on extracted teeth. Let me show you how it's done easily. Let me be there with you, show you the new system that makes it very, and with the new technology and the new systems, it's, it's really becoming easier and easier. But they have to check these boxes and be comfortable with it to go to the next step and do their you know, first um, implant, do their first you know, bigger procedure that they, they wanna do. Um, so the basic requirements. You know, you have to drive in the, in, the, in the side streets before you go on the highway and before you travel interstate. That's that's basically the conversation that we have. And, and I like that on the uh, implant deal, because a lot of dentists say, well, I, I think I should um, pick the system before I start um, learning about implants. And I said, well, that's not how they did in driver's ed. I mean, you learned how to uh, uh, drive a car. Uh, they didn't ask you what kind of car you're going to have in driver's ed. They just tell you how to drive a damn car. <laughs> and then after you get your driver's license, you can go drive any car. One other thing about the kids that's um, um, a little uh, strange is when you look at the 100-year trend, uh, 1900, there were uh, no specialties and healthcare was 1% of the GDP. By the end of the century, 2000, uh, the healthcare was 14% of the GDP. The physicians had 58 specialties. Dentists had nine now it's only 2020 and the dentist is up to 12 specialties and the the healthcare is a gdp is 17 percent yet these kids want to come out and they, they, they want to master everything it's like hey 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 slow down spanky you can't you can't be a pediatric dentist and endodontist and implantologist and orthodontist and visalinologist i mean you can't and we're not going back to 1900 because the quality was really shitty when one guy did everything. So I, I love their enthusiasm. I mean, that's that's great. I love to see young kids bouncing off the walls. That's fun. But how do you get them to realize that in a country that publishes 40,000 healthcare journals a month, that um, hell, a lot of people, when they're looking for an ophthalmologist, need one that specializes just in diabetes glaucoma, just for retina detachment. How do you get them to, to focus and be really, really good at something instead of just barely being able to do 12 different specialties in dentistry. That's the beauty of having partners. Um, I'll, I'll share with you what I have in, 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 in our group in, in, uh, with Guardian. You know, one of our partners in North Carolina, um, for example, is um, amazing with sleep apnea. 
our partner in Virginia is amazing with, um, you know, Invisalign and uh, orthodontics and sleep apnea. So we refer within our networks and we refer within our regions. It's back to the same conversation. I'll sit down with the doctor. What is your goal? What's your plan? What's your genius? If you're scared of blood and you want to place implants, well, let's see. Can you do an extraction predictably? Can you flap? Can you suture okay? Let's work on these skills first. You cannot be jack of all trades, even though general dentist, and that's the struggle with general dentists, is that we all want to be the best at everything. And it's really hard and run our business and be, you know, the cheerleaders for our teams and, uh, you know, inspire everybody and take care of our patients. It's really hard. So the conversation with the doctors, what's your, ge- what's your genius? What is it that you want to do? Where do you see yourself? Let's have a plan of action. Let's write the roadmap here. You want to do implants? Okay, are you good with fillings? Are you good with extractions? Do you understand basic surgical procedures? Can you use flap a tissue? Do, can you control bleeding? Have you, uh, can you take out wisdom teeth? Can you suture? Yes, yes, yes. Show me and we guide them. Okay, let's go to the next step. Now you want to do an implant. Let's get you on that journey. You can do implants and sleep apnea and orthodontics and full digital smile design at the same time. Get perfect one skill. Let's do the mentorship. Let's see how you do. And take a moment to celebrate this and Share it with your partners, share it with the other associates. Tell them, hey, I got this extensive training in that specialty, and this is the amount of time and effort I put in. If you have a case you don't want to do or you can't do, refer it to me. And I'll refer what I can do as far as, you know, second molar endos to you that now you have a microscope in your office. So we refer from within, and we have specialists also in our group. Um, that help us out and mentor our doctors. And they know by mentoring our doctors and help mentor our doctors, uh, they're getting more referrals. I'll give you an example. At seven o'clock tonight, the perio lecture is by the periodontist in our group in Pennsylvania. He's teaching all doctors some principles and sharing some amazing endoperio um, lesions, some gum graftings and implants. He, he knows and he, he believes that by teaching the doctors to do the right thing, they will do what they, they're good at doing, and that's not going to cause harm to our patients and serve our patients, and they will refer to him what they can do. That's the whole purpose of that network that we have. And that's why we're teaching our doctors. Focus on one thing. I'll help you. I'll mentor you. Refer or ask for advice or take care of the patient by referring that patient to your colleague who's right next door who can take care of that patient better than you. And it, it, we're in the business of serving our community and our patients. And that's what we keep reminding our doctors to do. Well, I'll tell you what, um, my gosh, um, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for uh, staying on, on overtime. Um, and um, thank you for all you're doing for dentistry. Um, I've noticed during the pandemic, like say on Dentaltown, um, there was always 4,000 ads for jobs available and 1,000 guys wanted out. Now there's 2,000 practices for sale and there's only 1,000 for jobs that are doing it. And it's only group practice. I, I don't like the term DSO because it doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, a DSO, you first need to become a group practice and figure out all of that, the leadership, the mentorship, and then you have to go to a second location and um, the, I just think it's just very telling how the sweet spot of bankruptcy now, when I got out of school, it used to be, you know, a uh, 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 dental office got so small that it went bankrupt. Now it's between like three and four million. They borrowed a bunch of money and they bought two or more offices and they overexpanded and they don't know what they're doing. They didn't have the systems. And it seems like now it's the, they, they, they get too big and fail. And dentistry is just group practice and, and you're going to have – and. Um, everything you learned in kindergarten, get along in the, in the sandbox. And now, uh, you know, uh, now I got six grandkids and it's tough, you know, trying to teach parents. Okay. Th- this kid doesn't understand the concept of sharing. It's two. If you want this child to share, why don't you teach it geometry? Let's sit down and teach it calculus. Um, you know, it's the relationship stuff 
is the hardest. And I always thought that was weird about school where you, you graduate from high school and they taught you all this arcane stuff that no one uses, but the, the kids, they don't even know how humans work, how humans function and how, how they operate. And, and um, But this is what I want to say at the end of the road. When you're all sitting out there debating whether you believe in indemnity insurance, uh, cash practice or PPOs or HMOs or whatever, or when you're telling me about you know, solo practice, group practice, DSOs, whatever, or what you think of Blue Cross or Blue Shield or Aetna or whatever stuff. Put all those numerators on the top, and then it's all going to be divided by a denominator called the patient. So I don't want to hear what you think about what Delta versus Blue Cross or DSO versus individual or DPN or whatever stuff. You keep one eye on the patient and one eye on cost, or there are 8 billion people on earth who will not have the freedom to afford to keep their tooth. And it's not about the dentist. It's about that patient. And all the dentists, all the technology companies, all the insurance companies, whatever, we're all working together for the patient. And it's patient-centric, and if you want to tell me, if you want to get out the world's smallest violin and tell me how this is bad for you, I don't care. I mean, there's 8 billion people, and you're a dentist, and the number one disease in the world since they started measuring it has always been dental decay. Only 5% of Americans will see a chiropractor. 100% of earthlings will see the dentist, and it's not going to be pretty. It's because they're in pain. So everybody in dentistry, everybody in the value chain, everybody, I don't care if you make dental chairs, burrs, or do cleanings. Um, I don't care what your debate is about dental therapist versus hygienist versus expanded. I, I don't even care. My question is, why are eight and a half out of every hundred people at an emergency room from odontogenic in origin? That's us people. We're dropping the ball. And anybody who is trying to make that ball better, faster, easier, higher quality, cheaper, whatever for the consumer is my friend. And that is you, my man. Um, both of you guys. Um, big fans of you. Uh, thank you so much. He's Shum, Barakat, DDS, MAGD. And his mafiosa friend from the Sopranos, Mark <laughs> Senoprano, Chief Operating Officer. Thank you guys so much for coming on the show, and thank you for all that you do for dentistry. Thank you it's very much. Pleasure, Howard. It was a pleasure. It was yep. a real pleasure. Thank you, thank sir. you so much.